Allow me to paint a picture for you. It is 1959. Space is not black, but red. With the Soviet Union slightly ahead of the United States with Sputnik 1 and 2, the US looks forward to get ahead of the Soviets in the next leg of the race. What is that you may ask? Putting a man in space. With proposals already under review even before Sputnik, and eventually with two launch vehicles and seven men, the US seems ready to take the lead. This is the first US manned spaceflight, Mercury Redstone 3, or better known as Freedom 7. The beginning of what would eventually become Project Mercury began six days after NASA's operational birth. On October 7, 1968, NASA Administrator T. Keith Glennon approved the manned satellite project by saying, in effect, let's get on with it. Three months later, in January of 59, NASA chose the McDonnell Aircraft Corporation as their primary contractor for the Mercury spacecraft, saying that they could have the first three spacecraft within 10 months. That same month, NASA also requested the Army Ordnance Missile Command to construct eight Redstone launch vehicles for both unmanned and manned spaceflight missions. Between these 10 months, extensive research and development was put into Project Mercury, such as drop tests, wind tunnel testing, heat shield research, and escape tower development. Also within this 10 month window was selection of the men who would eventually fly the Mercury spacecraft. To even be considered, pilots had to be less than 40 years old, less than 5 feet 11 inches tall with a bachelor's degree in science or engineering, and be a graduate of test pilot school with a minimum of 1500 flying hours in a jet aircraft. There were 508 military test pilots in total of whom 225 were Air Force, 225 Navy, 23 Marine Corps, and 35 Army. Of these 508 pilots, 110 were selected and brought to the Pentagon in DC. Then this 110 was shrunk to 32 candidates. Also since the degree of interest indicated that far fewer would drop out of training than anticipated, NASA decided to cut the number from 32 to just 6. Then came a grueling series of physical and psychological tests at the Lovelace Clinic and the Wright Aerospace Medical Laboratory from January to March. The tests included spending hours on treadmills and tilt tables, submerging their feet in ice cold water, three doses of castor oil, and five enemas. Only one candidate, Jim Lovell, was eliminated on medical grounds at this stage. Of the remaining 13, ultimately seven instead of six were chosen. These seven were officially announced to the world at a NASA press conference on April 9th. These seven are 33-year-old Navy Lieutenant Malcolm Scott Carpenter. We'll call him Scott. 32-year-old Air Force Captain Leroy Gordon Cooper Jr. People call him Gordo. 37-year-old Marine Lieutenant Colonel John Herschel Glenn Jr. 33-year-old Air Force Captain Virgil Ivan Grissom. He goes by Gus. 36-year-old Navy Lieutenant Commander Walter Marty Sherrod Jr., better known as Wally. 35-year-old Navy Lieutenant Commander Alan Bartlett Shepard Jr. And to round it off, 35-year-old Air Force Captain Donald Kent Slayton. He goes by Deke. And of course, not even an hour can go by without someone asking. Uh, gentlemen, which one of you will be first into space? Astronaut training for Project Mercury was as exotic as it was new. Spacecraft familiarization, gimbal training, ingress and egress training, centrifuge training, weightless training, survival training, and most importantly, emergency training. Along with astronaut training, testing and development of the Mercury spacecraft systems and its booster were still underway. Seven flights designed to test the escape launch system, codenamed Little Joe, were flown from August of 59 to April of 61. Alongside this, McDonnell had delivered the first production spacecraft only two months after their 10-month proposal. While this spacecraft would be used for the first Atlas test flight, the booster designated for Mercury orbital flight, the second would be used for the first Mercury Redstone test flight, or what would have been. Mercury Redstone 1 launched 4 inches off the ground, followed by an unscheduled escape tower jettison and parachute deployment on November 20th, 1960. Almost a month later on December 19th, NASA would try again. 
Mercury Redstone 1A successfully launched and made a suborbital hop on the same day, along with Mercury Spacecraft No. 2 being recovered in the Atlantic Ocean. Then on January 31st, 1961, it was time for a chimp named Ham to take a ride in the Mercury spacecraft. Mercury Redstone 2 was launched and Ham survived the suborbital hop on January 31st, 1961. By this time, there still had been no astronaut chosen to fly the first manned mission into space. However, the Space Task Group had decided to train Shepard, Glenn, and Grissom, especially for the Mercury Redstone 3 mission allowing the remaining astronauts to prepare for the ground support jobs and the Mercury Atlas orbital missions. Shepard's activity chart for 1961 showed that he spent 18 days at Cape Canaveral being oriented to spacecraft number 7. Long before the final phases of pilot preparations came about, Shepard and Walter C. Williams had insisted that the designated astronaut must become an integral part of pre-flight checkout. So based on this procedure, Shepard and Glenn acquired a special feel of Spacecraft No. 7's attitude control system in hangar checkouts. Then on February 22nd, the Space Task Group officially announced that Shepard, Glenn, and Grissom had been chosen to begin special training for the Mercury Redstone 3 mission. More than a month before the public announcement, Director of NASA's Manned Spacecraft Center, Robert R. Gilruth, personally made his choice even down to the exact flight order of the men selected. He had chosen Alan Shepard as the prime astronaut, with John Glenn as his backup for Mercury Redstone 3. Mercury Redstone 3 was initially slated to launch sometime in March, but then NASA planned one more test flight to ensure that the Redstone was man-rated. Mercury Redstone BD launched on March 24, 1961. The mission was highly successful, proving that the Redstone was ready for manned flight. But this test flight came with some serious repercussions. Due to MRBD, Little Joe 5, and Mercury Atlas 3, MR3 was pushed back almost two months after its initial launch date. The Mercury team, aware of but not dominated by the space race, could only hope that the Russian spacecraft team was having comparable final checkout difficulties. This was not the case. They've got a man up there, it's Gagarin. <laughs> On April 12, 1961, Yuri Gagarin, aboard Vostok 1, not only became the first man into space, but the first man into orbit. Had MRBD not have been unneededly scheduled, this would have been the picture of the first man going into space. MR3 would have launched before Vostok 1, and Alan Shepard would have been the first man into space. Launch Day, May 2, 1961 With Shepard suited and prepared, this launch was scrubbed due to weather problems and was rescheduled for May 4th, when it was delayed again for the same reason and set for the next day, May 5th. The countdown began at 8.30 p.m. the previous night. Shepard awakened at 1.10 a.m. and ate a breakfast of steak, eggs with toast, four cups of coffee, and orange juice. The steak and egg breakfast would soon become a tradition for astronauts the morning of their launch. At 5.15 a.m., Shepard arrived at Launch Complex 5, looked up at MR3, and ascended the launch gantry. Five minutes later, he entered the spacecraft. Shepard had named Mercury Spacecraft 7, Freedom 7, and in fighter pilot fashion, this was painted on the side of the spacecraft. If everything went well, he had two hours and five minutes to wait before liftoff. But then the holds came. Almost two and a half hours of unplanned holds to be exact, and during these holds, nature called. Gordo, I have to urinate. Urinate? No. Now, Alan needs to go. And because the mission would last under 20 minutes, no one had thought to equip the Mercury spacecraft with a urine collection device. So Shepard tells the ground crews to turn off the electrodes on his body, and he goes. In the suit. The urine pulled somewhat underneath his back, and with oxygen flowing through the spacesuit, he was soon dried out and the countdown resumed. Roger, ready to resume the uh, count, uh, STE. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Stoney, uh, verify. Okay, Stoney, take it over. Roger. Five, six, All right, uh, lift off and the clock has started. Yes, sir, reading you loud and clear.
Mercury Redstone 3 launched from Cape Canaveral Launch Complex 5 on May 5th, 1961. The ride is only about 15 minutes long, so I thought, let's take the ride with Big Al. This is Freedom 7, the fuel is go, 1.2G, cabin at 14 PSI, oxygen is go. Cabin pressure is holding at 5.5. Cabin holding at 5.5. I understand. Cabin holding at 5.5. The fuel is go. 2.5 G. Cabin 5.5. Oxygen is go. The main bus is 24, and the isolated battery is 29. Roger. Okay. Okay. It's a lot smoother now. A lot smoother. Roger. From launch to separation, the operation of the capsule is completely automatic. Seven year fuel is go, 4G, 5.5 cabin, oxygen go, all systems are go. All systems go, detector all okay. Cut off, tower jettison green. Disarm. After tower jettison, which occurred 2 minutes and 32 seconds after launch, Shepard disarmed the retro rocket jettison switch. Cap step is green. The periscope is coming out. And the turnaround has started. At 3 minutes, the automatic attitude control system faced the capsule to a heat shield forward position for the remainder of the flight. SCS is okay. Control movements. Now almost at the top of his suborbital trajectory, Shepard went to work on his most important task, determining whether an astronaut could control his spacecraft's attitude. Okay, switching to manual pitch. As manual pitch. His first action was to position the spacecraft in a retrofire attitude. While Shepard was in control of pitch, the automatic system was in control of yaw and roll. It's worth noting that the Mercury spacecraft is not capable of translation. Switching to manual yaw. I changed that manual yaw. Roger, three is okay. Yaw is okay. Switching manual roll. Uh, roll is okay. Roll okay, let's get it. On the periscope. What a beautiful view. Shepard was able to distinguish clearly the continental masses from the cloud masses. Cloud cover over Florida, three to four tenths near the eastern coast, obscures up through Hatteras. You can see Okeechobee, identify Andros Island, Identify the reefs. As Shepard sped over the peak of his trajectory, his flight plan dictated that he switched to the fly-by-wire mode of operation. Thus, Shepard would manually position Freedom 7 for the retro fire that was scheduled to occur shortly after obtaining the zenith. In retro attitude, are green. Retro one, very smooth. Retro two, retro three. All three retros are fired. Okay, three retros have fired. Retro jettison is back to arm. The booster. Uh, negative. The switching fly by wire. Roll is okay. Retro 
Roger, do not have a light. After the retro rockets fired, pieces of debris, including the restraining strap, flashed by the spacecraft's portholes as the retro pack was jettisoned. I do not have a light. I see the straps falling away. I heard a noise. As this happened, Shepard saw no confirming sequence light, but Slayton radioed confirmation of retro pack jettison. I will use override. Override use. The light is green. Oh, Roger. Periscope is retracting. I'm on fly-by-wire going to re-entry attitude. While riding down the re-entry curve toward a water landing, Shepard again assumed the fly-by-wire mode of control. Then Shepard allowed the automatic system to regain control and stabilize the spacecraft for re-entry. Projector right on the button. Okay, Buster, re-entry attitude. Switching ASCS normal. The SCS is okay. Uh, switching HF for radio check. Freedom 7, Capcom, how do you read HF? Uh, Roger, reading you loud and clear, HF, take army. Freedom 7, Capcom, how do you release it? Uh, reading you loud and clear, HF, Army. Back to you, HF. Okay, this is Freedom 7. Uh, G build up. During re entry, Shepard immediately reported when the .05G light came on, the indication that the G-load buildup was about to commence. Three, six, nine. As the re-entry loads began to build up to a peak of 11.6 Gs, the okay. oscillations also increased moderately. Okay. As soon as the highest G-point buildup had passed and the spacecraft had steadied, Shepard left fly-by-wire and cut in the automatic control system. As the altimeter dial slipped past 40,000 feet, the astronaut braced and listened closely for the drogue motor to fire. The drogue is green at 21. The periscope is out. The drogue is out. Main chute is green. Main chute is coming unraced and it looks good. The main chute is good. The rate of descent is reading about 35 feet per second. Affirmative Indian Capcom, let me give you a report. I'm at 7,000 feet, the main chute is good, the landing bag is on green, my peroxide has dumped, my condition is good. Shortly after landing in the water, Shepard egressed from the top of Freedom 7 as trained and was retrieved by helicopters of the Marine Air Force Group 26. The hovering chopper had no difficulty getting Shepard aboard and lifting Freedom 7 from the water and transporting it to the carrier Lake Chaplin. When Shepard finally stepped onto the carrier's deck, only 11 minutes had elapsed since the water landing. About half an hour after he had begun his free dictation report, Shepard was called to the flag bridge to answer an unexpected telephone call from President Kennedy, who had watched the launching and closely followed flight details through television and who now congratulated the astronaut on his flight into space. Now with Alan Shepard safe and sound, but the US yet again behind the Soviets in another aspect of space. Kennedy stood before Congress on May 25, 1961, not even a full month after Freedom 7, and proposed that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. That's one space flight in the books, and soon after, a giant goal for the fairly new space program. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please like, comment, and subscribe, as this channel will be going through all the missions of Project Mercury, Vostok, 
Foscard, Gemini, Soyuz, and Apollo.